Chase, so I don't screw up your presentation. <laughs> He's going to get mine up there. I just have a few slides uh, to show up front. I did, I wa did want to recognize Tom Lee, uh, who abs absolutely changed my life. Uh, and I'm a, a great admirer of him and it, how much he's enriched uh, my life and many others when you know about his work. His nephew is here, Joe Lee. So I want Joe to stand up. That is, uh, Joe, that is Joe's dad with his grandmother, Zola Utley in El Paso back in about 1915, I think the date is. So we're glad you're here, Joe. Uh, but I am, I am thrilled to be here uh, from El Paso as part of this event. Uh, this is part of this Tom Lee celebration that we have once, uh, once a year. It used to be a month. Now it extends for several, um, several months, actually most of the year, where we can explore. Tom Lee used to always say, my art is not about me. It's about you because look what you can see and do and experience in this marvelous life. And so Holly, this year our focus is on China, but I was going to, uh, and that's why we're talking about Homer Lee, but I just wanted uh, to show you a couple of pictures of El Paso and where Tom Lee uh, was from, the most western corner of Texas on the border of Chihuahua, Mexico. His mother, said that she could see the rim of Mount Franklin from her hospital window the day he was born. And actually, the day he was born, uh, which was in Ju July 11th, 1907, it's the same year, it's 100 years later, Lady Bird died on that same day. I remember when, when I read about that. Uh, but also when he died in, in uh, 2001, on January 29th, you could see Mount Franklin outside of his hospital window. Tom Lee drew his nourishment from his mountain and the borderlands throughout his 93-year-old life. Though he traveled far beyond it, he always returned home. I've been asked to say a few words about the connection between Tom Lee, LBJ, and Lady Bird before Chase's uh, presentation. An interesting fact, let's see, this way. Oop, it's upside down. Can you see that that's a church? <laughs> it's not a spike. <laughs> anyway, I don't know how that happened, but uh, it, this is the upside down First Baptist Church of El Paso, where Tom Lee's mother took him and his brother Joe as boys and where my great-grandfather baptized Tom when he was eight years old. It was founded in 1882 by LBJ's great uncle, George W. Baines, an early Baptist missionary. Baines wrote LBJ's granddad, his own father, a letter in 1882 that he'd never been in a place with so little re regard for the Lord's Day than in El Paso. So <laughs> that is, anyway, I, I hope all these aren't upside down. Here we go. We got it right side up. Another connection was Robert Ewing Thomason, the law partner of Tom Lee's father, Mayor Tom Lee. Once, when Lady Bird Johnson visited El Paso and spent the night with Tom and Sarah Lee, Tom, uh, Sarah commented beforehand, I was there having a drink. I did Tom Lee's oral history in 1993, which became a book. I got addicted to him. And so the last seven years of his life, I went over at least once a week uh, and had, would have a drink with them. But this time, uh, when Lady Bird, they were anticipating Lady Bird coming to El Paso and, uh, and staying with them, Sarah said, Tom, don't you think we should buy new towels? <laughs> and on that visit, it was on that visit uh, that Lady Bird told me that when Lyndon first went to Congress in 1937, Sam Rayburn told him that whatever R.E. Thomason did, and that is R.E. Thomason uh, pointing to LBJ, uh, whatever that uh, that. Uh, R.E. Thomason did that he wouldn't do badly to do exactly the same thing. If he went to the right of the aisle, he should go to the right. If he went to the left, it'd be a good idea for him to go to the left. 
Ari Thomason also served as, and Ari Thomason, by the way, is a grandfather of Dealey Herndon. Many of you all from Austin know Dealey and her brother, Robert Deckard, who was uh, CEO and chairman of the Belo Corporation. That was their grandfather from, uh, from El Paso in our courthouse that's been renamed for him. But he served as El Paso's mayor also and a state representative before going to Congress in 1930, resigning in 1947 to accept an appointment by Harry Truman to the federal bench. He served at all four levels of government, just like Chase Untermeyer, and was a leader in civil rights, integrating Texas Western College, now UTEP, in 1955 by admitting a black woman, Thelma White, soon after Brown versus the Board of Education decision. Maceo Daly, uh, who was uh, on the board of uh, Humanities Texas, as was I, a lovely man, head of African American studies in, in El Paso at UTEP, uh, once spoke during Tom Lee month about the influence of R.E. Thomason on LBJ's civil rights legislation. Here, here's a picture. These are both portraits by Tom Lee of Sam Rayburn, which is in the Rayburn Building in Washington, D.C., and then also of Ewing Thomason. That's in the Harry Ransom Humanities Research Center here on the UT campus. Tom Lee's painting, Springtime, also hung in the West Wing of the Johnson White House. The horseman is confidently riding a rocky, treacherous slope with eyes focused ahead. His Spanish-blooded stud is light-gated and is ridden with a spade bit, and we have an expert in the audience on spade bits, also called a signal bit, because it allows the horse to respond to signals before pressure is applied. You can see how loose those reins are. No doubt, there's a message regarding leadership through difficult terrain of the presidency in this painting. And though evidence of spring is subtle, it's there in the fresh leaves of a thorny mesquite. When the Johnsons hosted a party at the White House to honor Ewing and Abby Thomason and the Lees, Tom invited his collector and friend, C.R. Smith, the founder of American Airlines, whom LBJ ended up appointing Secretary of Commerce soon after that visit at the White House. C.R. Smith had organized the Air Transport Command for strategic airlifts during World War II. And when Tom served as an accredited artist correspondent for Life Magazine for four years, CR wrote a letter giving Tom permission to fly anywhere the ATC flew. This is a portrait Tom Lee did of his friend. Most of his portraits were done of friends. It's how Tom Lee, the letter from CR is how Tom Lee got to China, flying over the hump without a manifest How do we do it? How do, do, oh, there we go. This is a painting by Tom Lee uh, without a manifest in 1943. The, pi the pilot said, if we go down, no one will know what happened to you. While there, Tom Lee painted many things from China's crammed squalor. Do I? Oh, here. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, from China's crammed squalor to its majesty to portraits of Madame and Generalissimo Chiang Kai-shek, which are in the Harry Ransom Center. We'll see reproductions in our, um, here, there we go. Uh, to fighter pilots, there's a, how about if I just push that? This is Claire Chenault, uh, he sat over the flying tigers, he actually, sat for Tom Lee uh, in China. And this is one, uh, an article, Three Airmen, written by Johnny Hersey that was illustrated by, um, oops. Now I did something I shouldn't have done. There we go. 
uh, that was an article. Tom Lee, over 12 spreads in, big spreads in Life magazine during World War II, the most noted war correspondent of the war. But Tom, uh, Tom said that he thought many of his, his uh, what he was able to do in China came about because of the well-known name of Lee, as in Homer Lee, his father's first cousin. From the time he was a boy, a picture of Homer had been an icon in his father's den, alongside his father's collection of Casas Grande's pottery. So there you see Homer to the right. I'm looking forward to learning more about this man, Homer Lee, from Chase Untermeyer tonight. And I'm going to give you just a list. It's the abbreviated version of, of Chase's uh, bio. Graduate of Harvard, naval officer, served in all levels of government. He's been a state representative. He served three presidents in capacities ranging from assistant secretary of the Navy to director of White House personnel to ambassador to Qatar under George W. Bush to director of Voice of America a political reporter, professor at the Hobby School of Public Affairs at the University of Houston, and married to a wonderful woman who has heard him speak so much, he's not here tonight, but a, wonder <laughs> a wonderful horsewoman and an author of Cutter, Sand, Sea, and Sky. I'm very happy to introduce Chase Untermeyer. Thank you, Adair, and thank you to the Tom Lee Institute and the co-sponsors, the LBJ Library Foundation, the Library, and Humanities Texas for making this occasion a reality. It began, as Holly mentioned, uh, several months ago in, in beautiful El Paso and has, thank you, has uh, blossomed to tonight's event. I have to say that every time I come to this building, I remember the very first time I saw it, which was on a very cold, rainy January day in 1972. The library was less than a year in existence, and uh, there weren't many of us uh, poking around the exhibits, but of course, it was completely full of the spirit of Lyndon Johnson. There were the photographs of LBJ, the movies of LBJ, the cartoons of LBJ, the sculptures of LBJ, and after about two and a half hours, I figured I had absorbed about as much as I could and started to leave, and who should appear on the other side of the glass doors but LBJ? It was like the final exhibit, uh, Lind Lyndon Johnson behind glass. And uh, uh, as I say, I can never come through those doors without remembering his uh, immense bulk on the other side of it. But to get to another era and another fascinating personality, uh, it is my pleasure to talk to you tonight about Homer Lee. Now, the first time I heard Homer Lee's name, it was spoken by the late, legendary Claire Booth Luce playwright, journalist, congresswoman, ambassador, and widow of the publisher Henry Robinson Luce. She had been placed by her old compatriot, Ronald Reagan, on the US delegation for the last inauguration of Ferdinand Marcos as president of the Philippines. This was in June of 1981. Uh, the delegation was headed by my then boss, Vice President George Bush. Now then nearing 80, Ambassador Luce was still an active and glamorous personality, endowed with a treasury of talents, save only one, and that was the ability to sleep on airplanes. But Barbara Bush, who could, uh, asked me please to keep Claire company so that she and the VP could get some sleep in the bunks of the private cabin on Air Force Two. While well, mine was a mesmerizing assignment, listening to the most famous living American woman tell anecdote after anecdote for hour after hour as Air Force Two droned westward across the Pacific. It was appropriate we were headed to Manila because, well, let Claire say why. In early October 1941 in Manila, I was dining with several officers of the Philippine Department. We talked, as every visitor in Manila did in those days, of the possibility of a Japanese invasion of the Philippines. If it comes, where will they strike first, I asked. Colonel Charles Willoughby drew a deft map of Luzon on the tablecloth. 
Uh, the main attacks will probably come here at Lingayan Gulf, he said, making an arrow, and then here at Polio Bight, ye old pincer movement. You're not giving away military secrets. The officers all laughed. Willoughby pocketed his pencil. Oh no, he said, just quoting military gospel, according to Homer Lee. Well, never having heard of the man, Claire went to the New York Public Library when she returned home to do some research. And there she found two dusty volumes of military prophecy that Homer Lee had written decades earlier, The Valor of Ignorance and the Day of the Saxon. She was astonished by what she read. Homer Lee's life comprised what Claire called one of the strangest, most adventurous, and significant stories that America ever knew and had ever forgotten. She wrote a long article about him that she gave the editors at Life magazine, which was published by her husband, Henry. Well, amusingly, the editors rejected the work by the boss's wife, so she went to their great rival, the Saturday Evening Post, where it appeared in two parts in March of 1942. The $100 fee she received meant nothing to her financially, but the satisfaction of scooping her husband's publication was priceless. <laughs> Here, in the valor of ignorance, she wrote, was the prediction that Manila would be forced to surrender in three weeks. It was occupied by the Japanese 26 days after the opening of hostilities. Here was the very picture of the convergent attack at right angles, the pincer movement from Lingayan Gulf and Polio Bight. Here above all was a solemn warning against putting undue faith in impregnable forts in Manila Harbor like Corregidor. As Claire related, Homer Lee was born in Denver on the 17th of November, 1876, but grew up in Los Angeles. He was first cousin once removed of the artist Tom Lee. Considering that Tom was only five when Homer died, there is scant chance they were ever together, and in any event, Tom's father said, I never met a man that was more conceited and had less time for his kinfolks than Homer Lee. According to Tom Lee's oral history, taken by Adair, someone dropped the infant Homer on the flagstone hearth of the home in Denver, causing permanent injury to his spine. As a consequence, he never exceeded five feet in height, his schoolmates called him Little Scrunch Neck. He yearned to be a soldier, but his spinal deformity prevented this. Even so, he told a friend, all great careers are carved out by the sword. Mine too, I shall carve that way. He studied languages, including Chinese, at Occidental College in California, followed by law at Stanford. In daydreams, he saw himself as the reincarnation of the Chinese historic martial monk. He liked to <coughs> carouse with, uh, in China's, uh, Chinatown in San Francisco uh, with members of a secret society who were dedicated to the reform of the Manchu dynasty. He resolved to go to China. A friend warned him that he might get his head cut off. Replied Homer, fortunately, they'll have a hard time finding my neck. Lee was provided funds by his Chinese friends in San Francisco and left for China in 1899, saying, I go to topple the Manchus from their ancient dragon throne. He made his way to what Westerners then still called Peking, or Beijing, and made contact with the imperial prime minister. A secret opponent of the dowager empress uh, Xi Ji, uh, he, uh, uh, the prime minister believed, that China needed to be opened, like Japan, to Western ideas, methods, and materiel. He gave Homer the rank of a lieutenant general and assigned him to troops in Shanxi province, just west of Beijing. Now, the dowager empress, Xi Ji, fiercely opposed China's having anything to do with the Fan Kui, or foreign devils. When she learned what her prime minister was up to, he fled. The Dowager Empress offered a reward of $20,000 for him and $10,000 for his young American general. There ensued the so-called Boxer Rebellion, stirred by Xi Ji to purge China of the foreign devils. Homer led his troops to Beijing, where the foreign legations were under siege. When an international relief force arrived, the US commander was surprised to find his Chinese allies led by a crippled young American in the uniform of a Manchu general. 
back on the throne, Xi Ji sent troops to hunt down Li, who escaped to Hong Kong. And there he met Dr. Sun Yat-sen. Okay, oh, I'm sorry, friends. I have to, there we go, there's Dr. Dr. Sun. A medical doctor who yearned to overthrow the Manchus. Uh, Sun saw talent in Homer Lee, telling him, should I succeed and my countrymen give me the power, I will make you my chief military advisor. Homer replied with typical self-confidence, make me that now and you will succeed. <laughs> Impressed, Dr. Sun promptly named Homer chief of staff of the revolutionary forces. Together, the two men journeyed to Tokyo to seek Japanese aid in deposing the Manchus. Claire Booth Luce wrote that Homer Lee discovered that it was the policy of a strong, modern, united Japan to keep its neighbor, China, weak, backward, and disunited. The better to dismember and conquer her, when the day came, it could do so safely. Well, Lee returned to the United States in 1901. His house on the beach at Santa Monica became Dr. Sun's official headquarters in exile. Lee recruited Chinese students into a kind of ROTC, staging drills in the countryside near San Francisco. He also spent seven months exploring the West with an eye to places where Japan might invade. He considered the United States utterly defenseless, dreamily mistaking greatness and prestige for disposable military power. Thus, the title of the book that resulted from his research, The Valor of Ignorance. Early on in the book, Homer asserted its theme. National existence is governed by this invariable law, that the boundaries of political units are never stationary. They must expand or shrink. And a nation that is rich, vain, and unprotected provokes wars and hastens its own ruin. Well, the world he saw in 1909 contained a Japan that understood this law and a United States that did not. Uh, the uh, nation that Commodore Matthew Calvert Perry found in 1853 had emerged from feudal isolation and in short order become a thrusting modern military state that would shock the world by trouncing China in 1895 and then Russia 20 years later the first time an Asian power had defeated a European nation since the Mongols had humbled Muscovy in the 14th century. In Homer Lee's colorful description, only a few years since, on some mountainous islands, a people little known fought among themselves with weapons as primitive as those of the siege of Troy. Their entire revenues were less than that of an American city, the cultivable land of the whole empire was less than one half the area of Illinois. Suddenly there rose up, and with the perennial power of poverty, in less than one decade, disemboweled the two vainest and vastest empires on earth, causing the whole earth to whisper in old and stale wonder at this new sun that rose with the suddenness of an unknown comet out of the eastern sea. Lee wrote that the new Pacific power of Japan was destined to clash with the new Pacific power of the United States, which had acquired the Philippines, Guam, and Hawaii in 1898, and Samoa two years later. He warned a somnolent United States, politically, there are no conditions that can restrain Japan from entering into war with this nation. Strong in faith to the red sun of her destiny, Japan began more than two decades ago her predetermined march to be the empire of the Pacific. This world has been whittled down to a small ball. Nowhere can nations consider themselves safe within their moats of space. Now the shrinkage of the earth in Lee's day was due to the advances and the size and speed of steamships. Although the dirigible and the airplane existed when Homer Lee wrote, neither of his two books even mention aviation, which would truly reduce the world to a small ball and in 1941 allow Japan to surprise and devastate the US fleet at its moorings in Pearl Harbor. Lee believed that the American people and not Japan are responsible for this approaching conflict. Yes, Japan was imperialistic, but Lee's law of history would drive it to attack an America that was rich, weak, decadent, and living in blithe ignorance of its danger. Japan's first target would be the Philippines, he said, 
and the invasion occurred exactly where Homer Lee had predicted and where General MacArthur's staff had told Claire Booth Luce, the Lingayen Gulf and Polio Bight. The loss of the Philippines by the United States, he said, would mean the end of European empires in Asia and the Pacific. And true enough, the fall of Manila was followed by those of Hong Kong and Singapore, and despite the defeat of Japan in 1945, American rule in the Philippines, British rule in India, Burma, Malaya, and Singapore, Dutch rule in Indonesia, and French rule in Indochina would all vanish in the post-war era. Homer Lee's greatest warnings to the United States in 1909 was the ease by which Japan could take Hawaii and the West Coast. Japanese troops would be aided, he said darkly, by subversives, Japanese immigrants living in those places. The US at the time was pitifully weak. Its military estimated at only 137,000, just 50,000 of whom were in the US Army. The rest were in state militias. Meanwhile, Japan had some 650,000 men in arms and 100 steamers at its disposal, by which it could transport an army across the breadth of the Pacific and invade California, Oregon, and Washington State. There they would find few and inadequate defenses. San Francisco would easily fall, and the mountains and deserts to its east would prevent an American relief force from counterattacking the Japanese army with any hope of success. To this ambition of Japan, there shall be no end, Lee predicted, until her islands have been raised as bare as rocks upon which fishermen spread their nets, or until the Japanese become the samurai of the human race and the remainder of men shall toil and trade for them and their greatness. Now, when The Valor of Ignorance was published in 1909, it caused a mild furor and sold 18,000 copies in the United States. Tellingly, in Japan, the book sold 84,000 copies, going through 24 editions in just one month. It became required reading for all Japanese officers, regardless of service. An equally impressed Kaiser Wilhelm invited Lee to witness German war maneuvers in 1910. 20 years later, according to Ambassador Luce, Adolf Hitler cribbed several paragraphs on the apparent inability of the democratic form of government to defend itself, inserting them in Mein Kampf. And Vladimir Lenin, who kept a copy of The Valor of Ignorance on his desk, said Homer Lee had the most exact knowledge of military affairs of anyone next to Clausewitz. Another great admirer of uh, Lee's book was Britain's most honored soldier, Field Marshal the Lord Roberts of Kandahar. He invited Lee to spend time with him in the UK, where together they pondered the possibility that England might one day be invaded by Germany. They were not alone in speculating on such a catastrophe. In fact, dire descriptions in print of the fall of the British Empire were a minor industry in Edwardian England. Penny novels with titles like How John Bull Lost London and the Invasion of 1910 stirred excitement, anxiety, and huge sales. Lee's own book on the topic, which he dedicated to Lord Roberts, was The Day of the Saxon. And by Saxon, he meant Anglo-Saxon or British. In it, he saluted, again with his typical purple prose, this thin red Saxon line so thin with numbers, so red with his blood, has crossed every sea, it has traversed every desert, it has sought every solitude, it has passed through swamps where only the sacred ibis fishes, over sands that have never been moistened, and over snows that have never melted. But Lee saw Britain as victim to the same overconfidence that plagued the United States, and he blamed the nation's vulnerability on its historic reliance on the Royal Navy for protection. This echoed the warnings of Lord Roberts, a longtime advocate for a large and capable British army. Both believed in the centrality of India to the survival of the empire, and both worried about the growing German threat. Wrote Lee in the day of the Saxon, the British nation does not understand that German expansion is governed not by the passions of her people nor the ambitions of her ministers, but by principles that have their origin in natural forces the desire of Germany to destroy British sovereignty and create a Germanic world empire upon its ruins. The task of Germany is simple, that of England difficult. 
And if Germany was a new foe, there was still the old one, Russia, undaunted by its defeat at the hands of the Japanese. In an apt description of the nation that would confront Hitler and confronts the West today, Lee wrote, Russia in her progress of expansion is concerned no more with the devastation of her wars than is Russian nature with the havoc of her winters. These same Russians have never faltered, never hesitated. Without haste, always hopeful in defeat, reticent in victory, never seeing the ground they have furrowed with combat and hillocked with their dead, keeping their eyes constantly on those distant yet defined horizons toward which they have been directed. To Russia, having learned the philosophy of disaster, there comes no final defeat. The expansion of Russia in its intensity never ceases. Lee grimly predicted in the day of the Saxon that after the United States, Germany, Britain, and Japan were done fighting each other, there would be one last war between all of these nations and Russia. For this reason, Claire Booth Luce ended her two magazine articles about Homer Lee, written in the dire early days of US involvement in World War II, by saying, it is not as a gloomy forecast of defeat in 1942 that Lee should be read. It is as a still timely warning of trials to come after victory. In 1911, while still in London with Lord Roberts, Homer Lee received great news. Sun Yat-sen's movement in China was at last gaining momentum. He cabled Sun, who was in the United States, to join him in the UK, and together they sa sailed for Shanghai. With Lee once again a lieutenant general, they triumphed, and Sun became the first president of the Republic of China. Lee was the only Westerner present at the inaugural ceremony in Nanjing. After the oath-taking, Lee told President Sun, your republic, like ours, can only be preserved in its beauty and freedom by vigilant swords. China's enemies now are its historic pacifism, political corruption, and Japan. We, in the United States, have the same enemies. While in Nanjing, Li suffered a stroke and asked to be taken back to the US. In transit across the Pacific, he finished the Day of the Saxon. The book was not well received, selling only 7,000 copies. Lee died in his beach cottage at Santa Monica on the 1st of November, 1912, and was buried in his Chinese uniform. In 1969, his remains were reinterred in Taiwan, with vows that one day they would be re-reinterred with those of Sun Yat-sen in Nanjing. Now, Tom Lee may never have la even laid his toddler eyes on his eccentric cousin, but he, and admirers of his art, benefited from the family connection. And here is that story. During World War II, Tom was a combat artist for Life magazine. He saw service in the Pacific and North Africa before getting what he wanted, assignment to China. That country, torn and devastated by Japanese forces for over a decade, was of special interest to his boss, Henry Luce, who had been born there, the son of American missionaries. Luce sent a message to China's wartime capital. If Li is in Chongqing, have him do some paintings of China unrelated to the war and with some of the character and appearance of China. Then Luce added, see if you can get Li a sitting with the Generalissimo and Madame Chiang Kai-shek. Well, Chang had succeeded. Oh, that's here we go, back again. Yes, there we go. Chang had succeeded Sun Yat-sen as president of the Republic of China. His wife, born Sung Meiling, was the daughter of a rich Shanghai businessman who had been educated in the United States and had converted to Christianity. His children followed him in both pursuits. Mei Ling, a graduate of Wellesley, married Chang in a Christian ceremony in 1929. Madame Chang was extraordinarily attractive in appearance and elegant in manner. She spoke perfect American-accented English. Her sister, Ai Ling, uh, married a very wealthy businessman, H.H. H. Kung, and her other sister, Ching Ling, married a very old Sun Yat-sen. After his death, she became a follower of Mao Zedong. Chinese communists to this day like to say of the Sung sisters of Shanghai, one loved power, one loved money, and one loved China. It was first arranged for Tom Lee to make a drawing of H.H. H. Kung, Madame Chang's brother-in-law, the Minister of Finance. 
With armed guards lurking behind the curtains, Tom saw the sitting as a test to see if I was some kind of agent before I could get to the big Hong Cho. That chance came two weeks later when he got a call from the Minister of Information telling him to be at the Chang's residence at four o'clock that afternoon. It was really quite impressive for a country boy, Tom recalled. He was taken to a room where waited the Generalissimo who entered uh, bearing a Big Ben alarm clock. It ticked away during the sitting uh, as a reminder that Chang was a very busy man with other things to do. When the alarm sounded, Tom asked for 10 more minutes, which were reluctantly granted him. In the artist's opinion, he made a pretty good drawing, except for the ear. Next, Tom was taken upstairs to the Chang's private quarters where waited Madame. As he recalled, she was delightful. She asked all about my hometown, and then I learned they had investigated me and found out that I was a relative of Homer Lee, and that was the reason they received me. Her portrait was easy because she was so decorative, but his was difficult. He wouldn't hold still worth a damn. I was told later that when Henry Luce came to see my China pictures, he said that I had missed the character of Chiang Kai-shek. Tom went on to Kunming to make a portrait of General Claire Chenault of Flying Tiger's fame, and then he traveled to otherworldly Guilin, a place of fantastical limestone hills that rise in the valley of the River Li. You know those wonderful landscapes popular with the Sung masters about the year 1200, Tom mused? Those sugar loaves, they're true. I couldn't believe it. The people who did all those paintings weren't making it up. They are there to this day and beautiful. It's really an enchanted place with the mists hanging down those cone-shaped mountains. China made an impression on me that would never, ever die. But on another occasion, Tom had this to say about China. Stinking weather, spit snow this afternoon, overcast, low and black. If I do get my ride tomorrow, this is my last night in China. Damned glad. But something I know, when I am on the other side of the earth, the days I have spent in China will rise up in memory always. The rest of my life I will know China's grandeur and squalor and China's power. Now, over the many years, Americans have had a similar love, hate, regard toward China, regardless whether or not they have ever been there. In the clipper ship era, they thought of China as a colorful and curious land of tea and home furnishings. In the latter half of the 19th century, they saw China as the inexhaustible source of immigrants stealing their jobs, prompting Congress to pass a Chinese Exclusion Act in 1882. Yet, about the same time, missionaries home from China spoke glowingly of the wonderful new Christians they had saved and served. The new 20th century brought news of Dr. Sun's revolution bringing down a monarchy and installing a republic, just as we had done in 1776. During World War II, Americans felt further solidarity with the Chinese as they battled the common enemy of Japan under the leadership of two Christians, Chiang Kai-shek and his lovely Mei Ling. It was a time when Kenneth Wary, a mortician who represented Nebraska in the US Senate, could declare that, with God's help, we will lift Shanghai up and up, ever up, until it is just like Kansas City. <laughs> Alas for Senator Wary and for Henry Luce, the American romance with China was to be abruptly dashed just a few years later. In 1949, Mao Zedong ousted the Changs from the mainland and commenced two decades of vicious denunciations of the United States. Then, with President Nixon's opening to China in 1972, the former enemy became a strategic ally against the Soviet Union. Today, China is once again seen as a military and economic rival, even an existential enemy. The place seems so confusing, yet for a country in existence for five millennia, it was not China that changed so much as American attitudes toward it. If Americans viewed the Chinese in the last century with a changing mix of feelings, they saw the Japanese only one way, as natural villains, malevolent, vile, and a favorite word, sneaky. In fact, a pretty straight line can be drawn from Homer Lee's warnings of a Japanese invasion of the West Coast to the Japanese Exclusion Act of 1924, 
to President Franklin Roosevelt's rapid decision early in the war to rouse Japanese Americans from their homes and businesses and confine them in grim internment camps. This cartoon speaks eloquently to that particular period, and if the artwork looks a little familiar, notice in the lower right-hand corner that it was done by Dr. Seuss, who was a political cartoonist in the years before he began writing books for baby boom children like myself. Now, Homer Lee correctly predicted that the Japanese and Americans were destined to clash over possession of the Pacific. As Roberta Wolstetter wrote in her 1962 classic, Pearl Harbor, Warning and Decision, war with the United States in 1941 was not chosen. The decision for war was forced by Tokyo's desire to avoid the more terrible alternative of losing status or abandoning the national objectives so that stopping at any point always became equivalent to accepting national humiliation or accepting the role of a second-rate power. The Japanese national objective, of which Wolstetter wrote, was the expansion of the empire, just as Homer Lee described. Toward that end, Japan joined the Allies during World War I, and at the Paris Peace Conference was awarded the former German islands in the North Pacific. Some of these islands became the site of intense bloody battles with US forces during the Second World War, such as Peleliu, the struggle for which was most dramatically captured by one of Tom Lee's most famous wartime paintings, The 2,000 Yard Stare. When the Japanese High Command determined in 1941 that it must attack the United States, they gave their job to their most distinguished naval officer, Admiral Yamamoto Isoroku. It was he who crafted the plan to use aircraft carriers to assault Pearl Harbor. He was fully confident he could carry off the attack successfully. But having attended Harvard and been a naval attache in Washington, Yamamoto knew the American people, and he knew that such an attack, though a tactical triumph, would only stir the American people to a righteous anger. He warned his superiors that if hostilities break out between Japan and the United States, it would not be enough for us to take Guam and the Philippines, nor even Hawaii and San Francisco. We should have to march into Washington and sign the treaty in the White House. And this, he knew, would never happen. Yamamoto achieved his short-term goal, but less than four years later, there befell to Japan what Homer Lee said would be the raising of their islands to bare rocks. And Yamamoto himself would be dead, the victim of a targeted aerial attack when American intelligence learned he would be flying at a certain time to a certain place in New Guinea. Incidentally, Yamamoto's surprise attack on Pearl Harbor was not the first time it had happened. The first time was nine years earlier in 1932 when an aviation-minded U.S. admiral staged a Sunday morning air raid on the base to test its defenses. The embarrassed local commander protested the drill, calling it unfair. An attack on Pearl Harbor, he said, was highly unlikely. So how are we today to assess Homer Lee, and what value, if any, does a reading of his prophecies tell us about the world? Well, he was right in predicting a Pacific War caused by Japan's expansion and America's lack of preparedness. He was right in predicting that Japan would invade the Philippines and identifying the places where its troops would land. He was right in predicting the end of European and American colonial rule in Asia. He was right in saying that the survival of Australia and New Zealand depended on their protection by a major naval power, though in World War II this turned out to be the United States and not the United Kingdom. And he was right in seeing a world in which the United States and Britain would be joined by their former foes, Germany and Japan, in confronting Russia. On the other hand, he was wrong in predicting that Japan would invade the U.S. West Coast and inflict a humiliating defeat on this country. He was wrong in saying Germany wanted to invade and subjugate Great Britain instead of its actual target in two world wars, France. He was wrong in thinking that Britain would lose its empire to the aggressions of Germany, Japan, and Russia, when in fact it was Britain's own decision, in Mahatma Gandhi's phrase, to walk out of its colonies, granting them independence for political and economic rather than military reasons. And he completely failed to foresee that aviation could let nations project military strength worldwide and vastly speed up the delivery of troops and weapons to their targets. 
This was perhaps because Homer, like other military men of his day, saw the airplane as a novelty, perhaps fit for observing the enemy, but otherwise less useful in warfare than the Mark I horse. And Homer got his beloved China wrong. To be fair, the China he knew was in the dying throes of the Manchu dynasty, at the midpoint of what the Chinese today call their century of humiliations, pitifully weak and vulnerable to European and Japanese aggression. China still existed as a nation, Lee believed, not because of its strength and resilience and the energy of its people, but because of its physical isolation. Otherwise, he wrote, it would have gone down in due time and now be but a memory hidden away in the old tales of the tribes of man. If Homer Lee were alive today, he would assert that his law of nations still holds. Japan is no longer a threat because it failed to expand. And China is a threat because that is precisely what it is doing. He might also say that the United States is once again exhibiting the valor of ignorance by being militarily unprepared, especially in naval strength. Well, we will give the last word about Homer Lee to the woman who revived his reputation for modern readers, Claire Booth Luce. Lee was neither a fascist nor a totalitarian. His ardent championing of Chinese democracy proved that. He was first a militarist. One sometimes suspects that he lost his country's wars on paper, partially because his deformity prevented all possibility of his helping to win them on the battlefield. And Homer Lee fulfilled his own prophecy. He carved a great career out by the sword, but also by the pen. And I thank you very much for your kind attention. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Well, I hope I have not exhausted you, uh, if, but if there are any questions uh, for the next few minutes, I'll be happy to take them, and uh, then we can talk during the reception. So are there any further questions? Otherwise, I will take my standing ovation and go home. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yes. The controversy was imagining the United States of America going down to defeat before an enemy, but in particular, an Asian enemy. Uh, and what he described in great detail, far greater than I did uh, this evening, of uh, how e easy it was, he felt, that uh, they could invade the West Coast and how very difficult to impossible it would be for the United States to get them out if they did invade the West Coast. Uh, Quite possibly, he was right. Uh, certainly, he was right in terms of numbers and the disposable resources that Japan had uh, available. But uh, that was uh, too bitter for the, uh, folks in Washington to imagine. And of course, it didn't happen, but uh, that was only because uh, he was ahead of his time, uh, ahead of the time when Japan could attack the United States. Uh, it is very true that there there were many people who felt, uh, and and there were rumors of, of, of scares of uh, one sort or another in the West Coast, and that led almost immediately to Franklin Roosevelt's decree to uh, remove the Japanese uh, largely to camps in the West, although I understand there were some who actually came to Texas. There was a very major encampment outside Cody, Wyoming, which my wife, who's from Wyoming, and I visited last year. Uh, about 10 to 20,000 people were uh, in that one camp alone. And um, it, it's very embarrassing that one of the great liberal president, Franklin Roosevelt, would be the one to uh, order such a relocation, but it was upheld at the time by the US Supreme Court. Uh, subsequent years, the US government has uh, apologized and recognized the, its mistake, 
And very interestingly uh, and very poignantly, uh, there was an effort made by uh, then Senator Al Simpson of Wyoming and then Congressman Norman Mineta of California uh, to put together a, uh, an exhibit hall that's in Cody, Wyoming. Next time you're out there, be sure to go look at the Heart Mountain relocation site. Uh, they had met as two Boy Scouts. Uh, Norm Mineta had been a member of the internment camp Boy Scout troop, and Al Simpson was a member of the Cody, Wyoming Boy Scout troop. Uh, they met as teenagers, kept up their friendship, and uh, led to that uh, very interesting reconciliation. Yes, please. Uh, if, if so, it's uh, limited to this room. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I, I'm really not aware of anything. Uh, from time to time, there are articles written about him, and there was a scholarly book uh, published about him several years ago. But uh, so far as I know, uh, he is not taught in West Point or elsewhere. So uh, we can spread the word. All right. Well, oh, yes, please. Uh, a very good question uh, about uh, whether I know uh, how Homer Lee is regarded in China today. I, I do not know, uh, but I, uh, I, I infer that he would be considered on the plus or positive side because of his association with Sun Yat-sen. And even though Sun Yat-sen created a Republic of China, the very name that Taiwan still calls itself, uh, he, Sun Yat-sen, is honored in China, as we saw uh, his a uh, uh, magnificent mausoleum in Nanjing is still a, a major tourist attraction. So I infer that Homer Lee would be given due credit as a compatriot of Sun Yat-sen. Uh, but uh, you've stirred my curiosity, and perhaps uh, I'll find out one of these days. Yes, uh, there too, I uh, would love to explore how they feel about it, uh, particularly given that he is uh, buried there or interred. So uh, my guess is that he is uh, uh, so regarded, but I, uh, I'm going to have to do some more digging to answer your question in full. Well, again, thank you all very much for coming this evening, and now let us enjoy the reception. <laughs>